I read something very interesting, which said that in Victorian times, and this leads back into like the, the notions of not just some of the characters in, in your own work, but also in Borley Rectory, that in, specifically in Victorian times, the notion of seeing ghosts mm. became particularly centred on on women. Mm. And why why do you think that was? And why um, do you think that quite often that the especially in modern times? I think or, maybe. Th- there's a number of things, observations here. I think, uh, I was going to say mythologically or traditionally, the rational mind is the province of the male right. and the kind of like instinctive mind is the province of the female. That goes back to kind of the, the sibyls and sorceresses of ancient law. Yeah. And I think that goes right the way into spiritualism. I think spiritualism is interesting politically because in Victorian society, women were not empowered really in many many arenas of life but they found this one arena where they could be powerful and paradoxically it was to do with the kind of mythic and legendary idea of second sight and and uh, intu- intuition and that kind of thing so they found a kind of niche where the where figures could be feministically powerful in a way and there are some interesting books about feminism come spiritualism and ghost seeing and how those things are connected also i think uh, parallel to that or a different kind of scene is you know the the thing about um, hysteria and um, the kind of gender politics of that, the fact yeah. that the early researchers thought that hysteria you know, was to do literally with um, female biology and hy- hysteria it's and like kind a genetic of, flaw. Yeah, but, uh, but also to, to do with a kind of super sensitivity and I think the super sensitivity of females you know, in a rather kind of sexist way kind of goes into the idea of women b- being more um, susceptible to paranormal or psychic um, perception than men. Um, so I think it's a kind of stereotypical thing that, that you can see a number of confluences of, of, of ideas, you know, enabling that to happen really in a way. I think it's interesting that, that that sort of stream still continues in sort of modern fiction as well. But the other thing, there's something which I've always found really interesting about your particular work, and it's something, I think it was a quote that I got from you when I interviewed you about Gothic, mm. where you said that you believe that ghosts quite often were manifestation of a fatal flaw mm. or something missing in a character. Mm. Could you explain what, exactly what you, you meant by that? Um, I think my, I do believe that in my, in my work, I would say, um, that's the mechanism by which I figure out how to tell a ghost story. Right. To be honest, it might be uh, it might be sp- um, specifically to do with dramatization rather than kind of literary ghost. Um, but I find when I find that the interesting person in a ghost story is the person that sees the ghost. Yes. And the person that goes through a, a change or or not a change, and that's what you're interested in a, in a story, is the person that has the experience. So what is the experience? Why do they have the experience? It might not be technically why they see the ghost, but why why that ghost at that time for that character is what yeah. you're telling in the story. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So I would I would only say from my point of view that's the kind of thing I ask myself, um, and it might be um, in in the in the, um, the 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 family in Ghost Watch. I think they saw the ghost. That was, it's mixed up with the feeling of an absent father in, in the household. So I think it's what I said earlier on about the kind of wish and the repression of the wish. They want the father to come back, but the father figure that comes back, A, is not really a father figure because he dresses in women's clothes, so it's, that's all mixed up. Yeah. But was he's that done on of, purpose? Yeah, it was to mess up, right. it was to mess up gender to a certain extent um, and, to, and to be um, transgressive. Right. So on every possible level, the ghost is, is kind of transgressive. Um, and in afterlife, the ghost is, um, you know, the fatal flaw is really about Robert's inability to come to terms with uh, the death of his son. Right. And that's what the whole series is really about. And then when he locks horns with a, a psychic that he doesn't believe in, you kind of know intuitively the journey you're going to go on is that she has to do something for him, he has to do something for her. They never say that. And uh, my pleasure looking back at the program is that we never actually say that. But if you get enjoyment from the way the series goes, it's all about the fact that both those characters have wounds. He has the wound of his son's death, which can be healed by the medium. And she has the wound of incipient madness and loss of control, which he as a psychologist can heal. 
but they never kind of acknowledge that that's the case. And so I hope that subconsciously you have a feeling if only these characters would just listen to each other Meet and get in the together, and they could... they'd be a whole yeah. that would actually work, you know. But of course they can't, and I, I think that's, I think that's a, 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 an exciting thing for drama myself. Absolutely. In, in The Awakening, the character starts off very much debunking um, yeah. a sort of paranormal phenomena. Well, the, um, well, the essence of um, the idea behind The Awakening really was, <clears throat> really was the ending first. Uh, and I was thinking about characters like Houdini, Harry Houdini, who were Ghostbusters, and the, the, the spiritualist defense uh, to him was always, well, underneath it, you really want to believe. And he would yeah. say, no, I really don't want to believe. Okay. Um, uh, and they would say, oh, you do. You know? <laughs> um, and I always thought that was a, a, an interesting kind of argument. Um, and I actually was, I was actually wondering about, um, you know, someone that, that had a, a really a repressed memory. And in other words, what if the ghost story they're investigating turns out to be about themselves? I'm always right. intrigued by that kind of in, in uh, Vertigo, where the real mystery in Vertigo is, is, is the, the character of the detective. Yeah. Uh, the policeman himself investigating himself. So the ultimate mystery is the character rather than the plot, you know? Yeah. So I thought, well, what, I wonder if you can do a ghost story like that, which is the ultimate, the ultimate mystery in the story is the person. So she's investigating a ghost that turns out to be fundamental to herself. Um, and I like that kind of like Russian doll yeah. aspect. And that of the ghost functions almost as a, a reminder yeah. of that, that buried knowledge. So, and also I like the idea that it's, it's, it's self-knowledge. She does open the door to self-knowledge, so the ghost enables self-knowledge, but self-knowledge also isn't necessarily a pleasurable thing. It can be a, 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 a horrid and discombobulating and and uh, you know um, destructive thing in a way so it's not an easy path to revelation and I like that kind of reversal I like I like the fact that revelations can be nasty I like the fact that a nasty event can be uh, life-changing in a good way you know I yeah. think I love those double-edged ironic kind of moments rather than a altogether happy moment or altogether tragic moment if you can double them in a way. I think those are most satisfying in drama.